As we go into this third part of modesty and dress, I want to make sure everybody understands completely that um, <clears throat> I've shared a number of very controversial things. Um, they're, you know, things I believe are uh, Yahweh's will for us. Um, but I just want everybody to know that uh, while I believe this is important, I don't go around peering down my nose at anybody who believes differently. Um, I really don't pay much attention to those who dress differently or whatever than I do. And uh, the reason is it's a very uh, weighty thing, you know. In some ways, I think it's it's sort of like when I share with somebody about the, the Sabbath or some other topic that is not very common in our culture. Um, there's this pause that people want to take, you know. They don't want to just jump into something and go, yeah, that's right, because the implications are pretty significant. Um, and so they want to make sure they've got it down and they can defend it and they understand it properly. And so there's a moment where people have to kind of take in what you're saying. And um, even if they see it, see what you're saying, there may be a, a moment where they have to kind of take it in and say, uh, okay, I think I understand that, but... Huh. And it might just go that far. Maybe Yahweh has to water it later. But um, I'm not a judge. I'm just a person who is subject to stricter judgment. So last thing I need is to start judging on top of being one who teaches. So I don't want to be that way toward anybody. I just want to walk in love and uh, let Yahweh uh, lead each person individually. But we are now on this third segment of Modesty and Dress, part number three. There will be a part number four. One minute. There will be a part number four, in case you're wondering. I don't know that there'll be a part number five. We're going to play that by ear. But there will be a part four. We're not going to talk about the, <clears throat> the lust aspect of Modesty quite yeah we got a, a couple areas of dress we need to talk about and uh, and then we'll get into that aspect of it in the next segment but uh, I do feel that this is pretty important as well um, last time that we um, went over some scriptures one of the scriptures we went over was mentioning the tattoos and all those, this is not technically dress. It's certainly something you, you're you wearing in a sense. You're wearing a tattoo, right? At least in some aspect of it. And so we want to be able to understand what Yahweh's will is regarding whether he wants us to, you know, be wearing these tattoos. And I've seen... Uh, some believers they actually even go as far as put scripture verses on their bodies as a permanent marking. And uh, so, but tattoos have become more and more popular in this generation. Uh, I know when I was growing up, and I'm 46 years old, but when I was growing up, tattoos were only done by men, and usually very worldly men at that. I mean, they were considered to be a sign of a man who's rough, tough, and in all likelihood, a drinker and a partier. And, but uh, now tattoos are more in the mainstream. Isn't it interesting that a lot of our trends in our culture uh, come from the worldly party type um, high society or low society, however you want to look at it. Um, but tattoos are more in the mainstream, and they're very rare among believers in Messiah. I, I do sometimes see believers get them done, but... Um, I don't know, a generation I grew up is very much taboo for any believer to, especially Christians, would never do such a thing. But now, oh, I guess things have kind of changed. Now, Scripture does say in Leviticus 19, 28, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the, tat for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you. Uh, I find it interesting that the only place this can be found is the law of Yahweh, and this highlights the inconsistency of mainstream Christianity and that they would quote this verse uh, to tell their congregants you cannot have a tattoo. So they kind of go through the law and pick and choose the things that they 
want to follow and the ones they don't, they saw so that's done away with. Um, but that's another issue. But in that they pick and choose. But in my mind, Yahweh's commandments apply today, including this one. And tattoos have become more and more popular, more and more mainstream. Many churches have changed their position to allow for it. Uh, only one of the reasons is because you know some believe the context here is for the dead. They say, well, it's for the dead. Um, he says, don't make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, and then he says, nor tattoo any marks on you. I am Yahweh. So there's two things being said here, I think. I mean, that's the way it looks to me. Don't make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on you, whether it's related or not. And maybe that was the only context in which somebody would get a tattoo on them was or print marks on them was for the dead. And so that's why it is the commandments given in this context doesn't mean that Yahweh says, well, as long as it's for the dead, go ahead. I mean, probably in that time, in that generation, if they were to get a tattoo, people would assume it was for the dead. But, you know, that's the details. But I noticed that the cutting of the flesh for the dead is specifically forbidden, and getting a tattoo uh, just, just, just says don't get a tattoo. So I don't think it's a good idea for us to tattoo ourselves. Um, I even avoid writing things on my hand, you know, phone numbers or whatever. Um, and also I think of the kind of communication this is. I mean... There are still a lot of people in our culture, uh, people as young as in their 40s, who still have that association of tattoos and worldliness. And, uh, and, so, and for people older than me, probably even more so. And so we have to ask ourselves, what does that communicate? We talked about how clothing talks. Well, if we're putting marks all over our body. I mean, if you got nothing but tattoos covered in your whole body, uh, or even just one here on your hand or your arm, but I mean, it can get really get ridiculous. But, you know, what kind of message are we communicating to them when we go out and get one of these tats, as they call them? I assure you, it's not a message of purity. I assure you, it's not a message of being set apart from the world. It seems to me, people in my generation, people generation older than mine, it communicates the opposite. It communicates I have decided to compromise. It communicates that uh, I am, you know, I'm in the world, I'm of the world. Uh, and so, you know, but I understand people find ways to justify it. Here's a scripture where people chose to justify it here in Revelation 19.15 says, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. With it he would strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress with the, uh, the fierceness and wrath of Almighty Elohim. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. On his thigh a name written on his thigh. Interesting. So they say, well, if he writes on his thigh, it must be a tattoo. King of kings, master of masters. It must be okay. Now, I've heard the Hebrew word for thigh and the Hebrew word for banner are actually very similar visually. John was a Jewish man and would have originally penned this book in Hebrew. And the only difference between the two, Ragel and Dagel, is the Hebrew has like this and like that. I mean, that's really the only difference. This is more of a resh, it curves, and this is uh, more square. And so Ragal and Dagal, they say, is, you know, maybe the copyist looked at that and, and there was actually a banner. It was written, King of Kings, Master of Masters, Adon Adonim, Melak Melakim. But, as I looked up the word Ragal and Dagal, okay, yeah, I do see... Actually, Ragel and Dagel look the same, obviously. But Ragel doesn't even mean thigh. It actually means foot. 
So I don't know. I don't know. But what do I do with that? I mean, I don't know that we need to take everything even literal here, right? I mean, really, does he have literally a sharp sword going out of his mouth? I mean, just... <laughs> um, or is it the word of Yahweh, spiritually, he's speaking of? Is his followers actually, isn't it said, the 144,000 have the name written on their foreheads? I have never seen anybody with uh, Yahweh on their forehead before. Um... Certainly spiritual. So Revelation 14, 1 talks about that. And even you might suggest because the um, priests had a crown on their head and it said Kodesh le Yahweh, holiness to Yahweh, that maybe that was actually, it's on their head, but there's actually a crown there It's saying that on their head. And so, you know, maybe that's actually, and, and it's also possible. Yes, it was written on Messiah's thigh, but really not literally his thigh. It was some on his clothing that was on his thigh. I mean, was his naked thigh being seen there in heaven? Uh, what I see here in Scripture is, it says, You shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs. And so, as I study this out, it's included inclusive of the thighs, not just to the thighs. It's more than a loincloth, which only covers the groin area. So the trousers, you know, were worn by high priests, and if they are a representation of the high priest in the heavenlies, it seems to me that um, we ought to be assuming that he wouldn't be going around naked in heaven. I mean waist to the thighs. It covers naked. This word nakedness in the Hebrew literally has naked flesh in its literal meaning. So that's kind of how I see the tattoo. I mean, priests wore trousers. They covered an area uh, on the waist to the thighs. Messiah is a high priest. But we'll be talking more about this uh, nakedness question uh, in next broadcast. Yahweh willing. So, another thing I want to talk about in, you know, the subject of the head coverings. I mean, head coverings, that's obviously something that is a garment, modesty and dress, so it covers the, the topic here. Um, there are men who wear the kippah on their head, um, and the reason why is they believe that, well, it says David covered his head one time, and... Um, and the other idea is that, well, we're priests, and priests wore turbans, and so since we're part of this Melchizedek priesthood and we're priests of our home, um, then we should wear some kind of headdress to signify that we are priests. And, uh, and so, okay, if that's your reasoning. Since you're a priest of your home, you're going to wear the turban or the headdress or the skull cap, or however you want to call it. If that's the real reason, why do you only do the head covering? Why don't you also do, you know, the linen tunic that the high priest is supposed to wear, the sash, you know, and the crown and the breastplate with the 12 stones, the whole outfit? Why do you just do the one thing? If you believe that's your conviction, you're supposed to. Why does the conviction only the headdress? It doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand that reasoning. Um, so, besides, we're not high priests functioning in an earthly tabernacle. That is a thing for the sons of Aaron. So, another popular teaching, particularly among Messianic people, is that um, when Messiah says, when you pray, you shall not pray like the hypocrites. They love standing in the synagogues and corners of the streets, and, and they might be seen by men. He says, you go, and you shut your door, and you pray to your Father who is in secret. And uh, the inner room where you're supposed to go in, they say, is the talit, where they would take the talit, and they would cover their heads, and, and that's where you pray. But I don't see that. In scripture, it says the word for talit, the word for inner room is a storage chamber, the storeroom. Nothing about uh, either in the Aramaic or the Greek, I should mention, anything about a talit. Nothing about a garment 
that you are wearing. I mean, think about this for a minute. I mean, if the idea is you go into some secret room somewhere, some secret place, um, you know, if you had a talit and then you put the talit over your head and everybody knows that that means you're praying, it kind of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? I mean, because you're supposed to be doing it in secret. <laughs> and if you put your talit over your head, there's no secret thing happening. Everybody knows you're praying. If that's the tradition, he's saying when you pray, go into your talit. Well, everybody would know you're praying. <laughs> so, but if you go in a secret place, in a room somewhere where nobody else is, and you pray, and then your Father in heaven will reward you. So I don't, I don't buy it. Actually, the word talit does not mean little tent. It means cover. Some people think it means little tent. It simply means a cover. Either way, Yahshua was not telling them one to cover their heads. He's telling them, find a secret room to pray. Don't be like the hypocrites, all everybody seeing you praying and everything. Um, because if you put the prayer shawl on, you know, everyone's going to know you're praying. So, the scripture actually says man should not cover their heads in prayer. Because Yahshua is the image and glory of Yahweh. Here in 1 Corinthians 11.3, it says, I want you to know the head of every man is Messiah, the head of woman is man, and the head of Messiah is Elohim. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. So if you put a head covering on, who are you dishonoring here? Who are you dishonoring? You are dishonoring the Messiah, your head. And the obvious question is why? I mean, but the simple reading is, if you put a head covering on, you're dishonoring the Savior. And now those who believe it's okay for men to cover their heads during prayer are often quick to point out, well, this is not only this is not anywhere else in the Bible. It's only here in, in Paul's writings. Not found in the Torah, not found in anybody else's writings and and for that reason, they feel as though they can reject that concept. Now, I just have one question for those of you who believe this. Um, do you believe that Paul is a liar? Do you believe he's speaking lies? He's, he's teaching falsehood when he says you dishonor the Savior by putting a head covering on your head. Or do you believe he's a man of truth? I mean, there's no middle ground. You can't say, well, he's if, he's... if he's telling lies at any point in Scripture, then the rest of it needs to be tossed out because it... nothing he says is worth anything. Because then you can start picking and choosing and say, well, he's lying over here but not here. Well, he's telling the truth over here, but he's lying over there. That's not the way we're supposed to operate. It's a Scripture. You have to make a decision as to whether you fully accept what Paul is teaching or you completely reject Paul. If even one teaching is false, you have to throw the whole thing out because who knows what else might be wrong. His integrity is completely gone at that point. If you toss his letter out, well, okay, you're going to have to toss out Luke and the book of Acts because Luke wrote the book of Acts and Peter, 1 Peter, Second uh, Peter says that Paul's letters are scripture. And so you might as well just gut the whole New Testament and throw it in the garbage because there's nothing much left. Now, I've noticed that there's some resistance. You know, well, this is new stuff. And there's a, a, a teaching ministry out there saying that if there's anything besides what's in the Torah, it's not to be followed. I completely disagree with it. We're commanded to baptize in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. That is nowhere found in the Torah. We are commanded to partake of the body and the blood of the Messiah. That's nowhere expressly commanded in the Torah. Neither commandment can be found expressly in the Torah. It's not anywhere. And so why do we have to be so hardened against anything else that might be new? I understand Yahshua is our mediator. He, just, he died and rose again. This event is bound to result in some things that you may not have heard before. I never said anything the Torah is abolished. I'm only saying 
there are some things that are new based on this new event. And scripture says the head of every man is Messiah. And man dishonors the Messiah when he covers his head during prayer. Simple as that. That's the simple reading. It doesn't have to go any further, but we will. We'll dig in further. Yahshua said, He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And so, when you dishonor the Messiah, you also dishonor the Father. Now, is it a sin to dishonor Messiah? Yes, it is. Well, if putting on a head covering is an act of dishonoring the Messiah, then putting on a head covering during prayer would be a sin because you're dishonoring the Messiah. Now, you might say, you know, doing something else, you know, um, make an obscene gesture toward heaven. Is that dishonoring him? Of course. Of course it's dishonoring him. Does it say in the Bible that it's dishonoring him? Well, no. But there are things that you can do to dishonor him that are not expressly commanded, and we have to understand why something would be dishonoring. Obviously, an obscene gesture would dishonor the Messiah. Um, you can't find a specific scripture that would say that, but we know that's a, dis, that's a disrespectful thing to do, and so it would be disrespectful toward the Messiah. And so my point is this, that they understood, first century believers understood the head covering and what it was all about. And Paul was sent by Yahshua himself. And Yahshua said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. That's Paul. He sent Paul out. Unless you don't believe Luke. But Paul was commissioned by Yahshua himself in Acts chapter 9. And we must receive what he says or we're going to reject the one Yahshua sends. And he who receives the one Yahshua sends, receives Yahshua. Now, I should not have to defend Paul's letters. I really shouldn't. I, it, to me, it sickens me that I have to defend his letters. Um, because I don't feel I should have to. I really don't. But there are some people who have gone so far in the Torah, that's crazily the way they've gone. I'm sorry to say crazily. It's just, I totally disagree. Um, but... Is this scripture actually even talking about a head covering? Some people say no. They say, um, well, the word head covered here, you know, this is talking about, you know, covering up the Messiah, spiritually meaning, you know, um, ignoring his presence, ignoring him as a mediator. And so you're trying to cover him up. And so the word head covering is... Not a literal head covering you put on your head, but a euphemism or spiritually spiritual way of saying that you're disregarding the Messiah, and so you're dishonoring him. That's the idea behind it. If you are prophesying and you're dishonoring the Messiah while you're prophesying, it says having your head covering while prayer or while prophecy, if that's what you were doing, if you were dishonoring the Messiah while you're prophesying, why would there ever be a prophecy coming out of your mouth? Why would Yahshua, why would Yahweh ever say, oh, okay, I'm going to give him this prophecy while he's dishonoring my son? See, that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, would it be like a paradox he's saying? Like, well, if you, if you prophesy while you're dishonoring the Messiah, then you're dishonoring the Messiah. If you prophesy while you don't regard the Messiah, then you're dishonoring the Messiah. Why would Yahweh send a prophecy from the Spirit when you're dishonoring his Son? And so, to me, that does not make any sense. Okay. Secondly, there's no historical evidence. You know, they talk about shaving of the head, you know, because they're talking about prostitutes practicing um, in Corinth, first century. And so, if you were to, you know, shave your head, uh, somehow, you know, Anyway, there is a lack of historical evidence showing short hair was the distinguishing mark of a prostitute. And so, in Roman times, Roman Corinth was a center of prostitution, bearing in mind depictions of prostitutes in Roman Paul paintings. Strabo's comments in geography referring to temple prostitutes only applied to Greek Corinth in existence. 
several centuries before the time of Paul, not at Roman Corinth of Paul's day. So the temple prostitute idea, they were the ones that had their heads shaved and all that, that's not valid. Scripture itself connects it to a physical head when hair is mentioned in verses 5 and verses 15, not saying a spiritual head in the sense of, you know, this is a covering Messiah is dishonoring him in some way. Uh, here's the examples. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. That's one the same as if her head was shaved. How do you do that? It doesn't make any sense. All right. Is it proper for a woman to pray with the Elohim with the head uncovered? If a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her. Hair is given to her for a covering. Talking about a physical covering in that instance. And the fourth reason, head covering, this is what I was going to talk about. It got out of order there. In verse 4, katakophile translated head covering in Septuagint in this location. Mordecai went back to the king's house, king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning in with his head covered. Haman, is what I meant to say, Haman had his head covered. Katakophile in the Greek, and every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Katakophile, same exact Greek phrase in both verses. So it is talking about a physical, literal head covering. He's not talking about a woman's head covering, because Haman certainly wouldn't have worn a, a woman's head covering, as some have claimed to be the case. Um, and so, um, now this same Hebrew word, the same Greek phrase is also used to describe David putting on a head covering. And um, so, I don't know, it cannot be a woman's head covering. Uh, it cannot be this phrase meaning dishonoring the Messiah. It's talking about a literal covering of the head. There's, to me, there's no way around it. I mean, you can try to say things, and this bothers me in some among some Messianics. They'll say certain things about Hebrew and certain things about you know Greek or whatever. It's not true. Um, they'll it's not it's not even true. <clears throat> and so when when I Whenever someone says, well, the Greek says, or the Hebrew says, I always look it up. And a lot of times, more often than it should be, it's simply not true what they're telling you. Um, you got to look it up, and you got to have some knowledge of how to look it up, too. Uh, not just grab things. So uh, I don't believe that this is in any way a female head covering. I don't believe it's head covering, meaning that, you know, ignoring the Messiah. Um... I do believe it's talking about a physical head covering. And he tells us why. For a man indeed ought not cover his head. Why? Why, Paul? Since he is the image and glory of Elohim. That's why. So the reason why men should not cover their heads while praying and prophesying is because man is the image and glory of Elohim. That's the reason that is provided for us. There is no other reason provided for us than that. So, what's that have to do with, with anything? What's that have to do with anything? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the... Uh, Image in glory of Elohim. Who are you? You are created in Yahweh's image. Brothers, you're created in Yahweh's image. Simple statement. Yahweh, therefore, when you are praying and you are prophesying, when there's communication going to Yahweh or communication coming from Yahweh, this is a holy thing. He does not want you to cover up what? His own image and his own glory while you are praying and prophesying. Now, the problem is Adam, he dishonored Yahweh through not walking in his image. He, his, Adam's image is not really Yahweh's image anymore, right? Because he's not loving 
Adam has failed in love, right? Adam is a terrible example of Yahweh's image in his glory. And actually, that's the whole problem. That's the whole reason why Yahshua had to come, was because we failed to reflect the image of Elohim. I had one elder tell me one time if there was one verse that summed up the whole Bible, it was, let us make man in our image. Because when the image was no longer Yahweh's image, then he had to do something about it. Either destroy us or send Yahshua the Messiah, the living image and the brightness of Yahweh's glory, the firstborn of all creation, the, the express image of his person, to restore us to that image and glory. Right? Does that make sense? Yahshua came to restore us to the image and glory of Elohim. So that it's no longer we who live, Galatians 2.20, it is Messiah who lives in us, and now we are a literal, Scripture says we are a part of his body. That means you don't long, you no longer live anymore, and Messiah now lives in you. In life you now live in the flesh, you live by Faith in the Son of Elohim who loved you and gave himself for you. And so you have been restored to the image and glory of Elohim through the body of the Messiah Yahshua. Therefore, when you cover that, you're dishonoring the Messiah who restored that. When you cover your head, you are dishonoring him who restored you to the image and glory of Elohim. And that's why he says, don't cover your head, since he's the image and glory of Elohim. Okay. Simple as that. I mean, that's Scripture 101, I hope. But it's no longer we who live. So, now I've got a more detailed study on this topic, um, which we'll share in a minute. But what about woman? Well, notice it says that woman is the glory of what? Of man. When did this happen? In the garden. Man, uh, Yahweh took woman out of man. Took him out. Took him out of man. And so he is the glory of man. And so the scripture says, uh, the rib, Yahweh Elohim caused deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in his place. Then the rib which El Yahweh Elohim had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. She was made for him and from him. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. All right. So, Scripture says, For a man indeed ought not cover his head, since he is the image and glory of Elohim, but woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. But I want you to know the head of every man is Messiah. The head of woman is man. The head of Messiah is Elohim, right? So he says, Every man praying or prophesying have his head covered dishonors his head, Messiah. Every woman who prays or prophesies with the head uncovered dishonors her head. Who's her head? Man. For that's one the same as if her head were shaved. When you shave your head, it's like you're trying to act like and, and conduct yourself like a man. And you're bypassing man. You're going directly to Messiah. And so you dishonor your you dishonor men by praying and prophesying with your head uncovered. You're dishonoring the authority that Yahweh placed in your life. If one's not covered, let her also be shorn. For, but it's shameful for one to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. Because if you're just going to 
Might as well just do the whole thing. Go ahead. Shave it all off. But he knew that would be a shameful thing to do, and so he pointed this out. For man not deed not to cover his head, since he's the image of glory of Elohim, but woman is the glory of man, and so she covers her head. Now Adam's glory is a lesser glory. Right? She was, she's made from Adam, right? And so in a in a manner of speaking, the uh thing being taught here is do not cover up the glory of Elohim but do cover up the glory of man the glory of Adam because Adam's glory shouldn't we shouldn't he shouldn't be seeing Adam's glory in his presence now when you're covering your head it doesn't mean that you're less than or that your worth is less or anything it is out of respect okay so through that, when you're covering your head, the head covering is representing the Messiah Yahshua and his covering over you. So, now, some people say, well, the hair is really what he's talking about here, Tom. That's why he says, you know, shave the head and, and all these things. He's really talking about the hair. And that's their the most common belief today. He says, because then he goes, judge for yourself, is it proper for a woman to pray to Elohim with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you? If a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him. If a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. And they say, there you go, Tom, there it is. He's talking about hair. Now, while that may sound plausible initially, this interpretation poses a number of problems. The word translated covering here, by the way, this translated covering for a covering, the Greek word is also found here. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10 through 12, it says, You, Yahweh, in the beginning lay the foundation of the earth, the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak, you will fold them up. Talking about the cloak. And they will be changed, but you are the same in your ears. So the hair is given as a cloak. Same Greek word. All right. And you take it back to the Hebrew. They will perish, you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak, you will change them. And they will be changed. So, here are the reasons why I don't believe he's talking about hair. First of all, long hair, by definition, does not cover the head any more than short hair. <laughs> right? I mean, it covers the back of your neck and maybe part of your back if you're wearing no clothes on your no shirt. <laughs> but, an open back shirt maybe, but it doesn't cover your head. It just doesn't. I've never seen where long hair covered the head any more than short hair. So whether you have short hair or long hair, the actual head still covered with hair. And only the neck and the back are covered when the person has long hair. So how could long hair be a head covering? Just that doesn't make any sense. Um, I mean, your head is your head. This this is my head from here to here. And this is my neck back here. And so the long hair only covers my neck. And I've seen a lot of men who kind of have hair going down a uh, little bit down the neck. Does that mean they're sinning? Um, no. No, they're not sinning. And so I don't really buy that whole thing. Secondly, what if a man took a Nazarite vow, like Paul did, Acts 18.18, 18, four brethren did it in Acts 21.23, they would be at some point not be permitted to pray because they would have the long hair. And so they can't pray without dishonoring the Savior because the long hair is supposed to be a head covering. 
That's pretty awful. Does that make any sense? No, it doesn't. Now, whether a man has long hair, short hair, has nothing to do with him being the image and glory of Yahweh through Yahshua the Messiah. It doesn't matter that his hair length isn't going to determine whether he is the image and glory of Yahweh. And fourthly, Scripture says, 1 Corinthians 11.10, the covering is a sign of authority because of the angels. How could your hair length be a sign of your authority? I don't get it. So there are some huge insurmountable problems with the idea that long hair is the head covering. What he's actually telling us, I really believe, is that um, the long hair does cover the neck, and so there is a kind of by nature thing showing you that um, you've got to have a, a natural covering going on there. And so by that illustration in nature, shows you should have a covering on your head. And so I think that's the illustration he's actually using. So he says, you know, Scripture itself teaches that the head covering principles. Okay. Here's the fifth reason I don't believe. If a woman's hair were a proper head covering, or long hair was a proper head covering, to cover the glory of Adam, why would the glory of Adam need to be covered in the Garden of Eden before sin ever came? Did Eve have short hair? I mean, righteous... And holy was Adam on the day he was created, and Eve was taken from the side, and so why would she have to have long hair? So, that's another problem. And let's suppose the hair was given as a head covering to cover the glory of Adam. The hair itself is says to be the glory of her, her glory. So why would Yahweh say, cover up your, your, your glory, Adam, but let woman's glory be manifest during praying and prophesying? And so... This whole thing becomes a convoluted, this doesn't make any sense kind of assertion to suggest the long hair is the covering. And so I don't believe it, even though it's very popular to believe it, um, I don't believe it. I understand why initially you might think, well, maybe it is, but you got to dig deeper. you got to understand the images and the glories and the different things that are going on here and so you might even suggest a head covering should cover the long hair because that's her glory um, and probably that's the best thing to do um, but I you know I could go on and, and go two weeks on this um, but because it's you know modesty and dress and I'm not saying a woman has to wear a head covering all day every day but when praying and if you ever get a prophecy, you better put one on your head. Now, if a prophecy was going to come, how would you know unless you already had one on your head? So, I mean, that's something to think about. Um, if I was a woman, I would wear a head covering all day, every day. I don't want there to be anything hindering my prayer life. And I know how it is. I've, you know, I've wore ball caps. I've wear straw hats when I'm out in a tractor, and you know, I don't want the the. I've got a you know, not much hair on my head, so I easily get sunburned there. And, uh, but, you know, every time I want to pray, i got to take this stupid hat off. <laughs> it's kind of a hindrance, kind of a inconvenience. Uh, how much more so if a woman is supposed to pray with a head covering on, you know, you don't bring a head covering with you to town, you got to find a napkin somewhere. And you look kind of silly putting a napkin on your head if you're wanting to pray before you eat, you know, or... If you want to pray or any time, you have no way to pray without dishonoring the line of headship that Yahweh has provided. And so my thinking, and I won't make a commandment out of it, I don't force my daughters to do it or my wife to do it, um, is it's best to keep a head covering on your head so that they're lay, it says pray without ceasing, right? So the lines of communication are always open and free between you and Yahweh. Yahweh has a word for you and you have a word for Yahweh. The lines of communication are free with nothing hindering. 
nothing at all hindering and uh, so I'm not going to make a doctrine out of it and you know say everybody has to wear a head covering all the time but if I was a woman that's definitely what I'd be doing uh, I, I mean a spiritual woman I would hope could hardly go an hour without praying and I'd hope we reach that level in our in our communication in our fellowship with Messiah I hope I hope we would get that that point so I know what I said is terribly unpopular I mean people just are up in arms about it but it's what I see in Scripture and anybody wants to show me something different I would be all ears to, to hear what that what that might be I just don't see anything else in Scripture and so I can't teach anything other than that I have to only teach what I see Yahweh's word actually saying and so here is the head covering study it was shared a couple of years ago uh, almost a uh, year and a half um, a study on should men cover their heads in prayer should women wear the head covering during prayer um, not the most popular teaching on my website I usually lose viewership after I share on the head covering <laughs> uh, I think I know why but it's what I see in Yahweh's Word and I'm always open to anyone sharing uh, you know with me something different than what I believe so um, I'm open but right now that's what I'm looking at is scripture is teaching that women should wear a head covering and men should not wear a head covering at least during prayer and prophesying all right so judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to Elohim with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you? Man has long hair. It's a dishonor to him if a woman has long hair. It's a glory to her for her hair is given to her for a covering. What's it cover? It covers the neck. It doesn't cover the head. It just covers the head. The neck. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom. What custom? You Are you saying, Paul, that you don't have this custom where you don't wear a head covering if you're a man and you do wear a head covering if you're a woman is that what you're saying or are you saying the long hair and the short hair um, question is a custom that's not really if you want to be contentious about it we don't have a custom that you that men have to have short hair and women have to have long hair it could go either way because there are two things mentioned here uh, I suggest that the custom he's referring to is the idea that when you know men should not have long hair and women should have long hair and I'll tell you why first of all um, what if a man has a Nazarite veil his hair would have to grow out and so that they can't make that a commandment when there's a Nazarite veil and actually Paul himself in Acts 18 took a Nazarite veil um, if a woman had leprosy or something, you have to shave the head and, you know, see what's going on with her head. And so, you know, I don't believe that that it was a command that men have to have short hair, women have to have long hair. But that's generally how it is. Okay. But I, I, see, I don't believe how, I don't see how I could possibly be saying it's okay to forget about everything I said about the head covering. Because he said, if you put a head covering on your head, man, you are dishonoring the Messiah. Are you saying that the assembly does not have a custom of giving the Messiah the due honor? Um, either what he, what he said was either the truth or it wasn't. Uh, he would be lying and saying, well, it's our belief, our custom that it dishonors the Messiah. But I don't really mean what I say. I just... You know, you decide whether or not, you know, it's either true or it isn't. He was either a liar or he was telling the truth. If, I, I don't see him being a liar. And so I believe he was telling the truth that a man with a head covering on dishonors a Savior. A woman dishonors her head 
and you're commanded, women are commanded to respect headship. And so if that's true, then it's not just some custom that you do, you decide what to do. Uh, it is a command that you honor the Messiah and that women reverence their husbands. So uh, this custom he's talking about, I don't believe he's talking about head covering, it has to be this long hair, short hair, which would have exceptions to what he's saying there. Other people suggest that well, we don't have the custom of being contentious. Uh, I think it's a little flip around words there, uh, wordplay or something. It doesn't, doesn't. I don't completely buy that idea, but that's one thing that people have suggested. Um, all right, so that's where I'm at with that. Now, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the words, the things I write to you, are the commandments of Yahweh. Is that true? I believe they are. They are the commandments of Yahweh. And so if this is Scripture and Peter says it is Scripture, um, I have to go along with this being the commandments of Yahweh. As a result of the Messiah's work, we are now his body. We're the body of Messiah. Men who choose to wear a head covering are causing the image and glory of Elohim to be covered. And therefore, they're dishonoring the Messiah and they're failing to give proper recognition to Yahweh's work in him. And we need to be a people who not only accept the good news that Yahshua lives in us, but are also acting like it and proclaiming this good news to all the world. And so when a man obeys the principles of the head covering, 1 Corinthians 11, he's recognizing Yahshua's work in him and in the heavenly high priesthood of Yahshua the Messiah, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, the priest that gave us access to the true holy of holies. And so therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Yahshua, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that's his flesh, his flesh is that veil, that's our covering, and having a high priest over the house of Elohim, let's draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed in with pure water. The new and living way. This is a new and living way. What's wrong with a new and living way? Nothing. Because it's new, doesn't mean it's bad. What did Yahshua say? Every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of the treasure his treasure things new and old. Are we instructed properly? Do we accept what's new and what's old? Some people don't want to accept the old. Some people don't want to accept the new. Let's be a scribe How about that. Our participation in Yahshua's death and resurrection is a new principle that was never expressly taught in the Torah. 1 Corinthians 11, other scriptures show us the head covering issues directly connected to that very thing. If he lives in us, don't dishonor him in your prayer by covering up the image and glory of Elohim, Yahshua, being in you. So in light of these things, <clears throat> when a man wears a head covering during prayer, he's actually... If he wears a head covering, you could say he's actually putting on a woman's garment during prayer because it's something a woman's supposed to do is cover her head during prayer. And so that would violate this also. A woman shall not wear anything pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all do so are an abomination to Yahweh, your mighty one. I'm not saying it's bad to wear a hat. Don't wear one during prayer, because that's what a woman's supposed to do. And uh, and so you can make the case. It's a woman's garment at that point. That's what the woman's supposed to do. Now, Yahweh wants there to be a clear distinction between men and women. He doesn't want men to wear a woman's garment. He doesn't want women wearing men's garments. Yahweh created men and women differently, and so we need to dress differently. Now, some church denominations and some believers like us have taken a position that pants are a man's garment and women should not be wearing pants. 
That was certainly the position in Protestant Christianity in America until fairly recent years. And so with this, we need to ask ourselves, to what extent should the clothing styles of the culture around us dictate whether certain garments are supposed to be a man's garment and whether certain garments are supposed to be a woman's garment? That can change and vary from one culture to another, from one generation to the next, it can change. Should culture have any impact on this particular scripture? It seems to me it should have some impact. Uh, if I was to uh, fly to another country somewhere and only women wore gray shirts, would that scripture require me to change to a different colored shirt? I think so. By principle, it would. Because the principle here is he doesn't want gender confusion. It would certainly impact my witness. And some in that particular culture may feel as though I'm trying to cross-dress. And hopefully most of us can agree with that idea. Now what about today here in America or in the country you happen to live in? There was a time in our country here in the United States where it was nearly unheard of that a woman would wear pants. The women who did wear pants were typically functioning in masculine type jobs, coal mining and so on. And there are reports of women who joined the Civil War and wore pants as part of their disguise. Some ancient culture actually will depict women wearing pants, but they were typically horse riders in the military. Historically, there was a connection between horse riding and women wearing pants. At times, the two seemed to go hand in hand, but there were exceptions. The ancient Persians, during the time that Israel was a nation, 700 BC, had women wearing trousers. And in American and European history, I can certainly find examples of women wearing pants underneath their dresses. Now, in Scripture, we see examples of priests wearing trousers underneath their garb. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 10. And the priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen trousers shall be on his body, and take up the ashes of the burnt offering, which the fire has consumed on the altar, he shall put them beside the altar. So he's got these linen trousers on here. Also, Shedrach, Meshach, and Abednego were said to have worn trousers underneath their robes. Daniel 3.20 he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. I can't find an example of women wearing trousers underneath their robes in scripture and because of that, some people might go, well, see, that proves that it's a man's garment. It's kind of a weak argument, though. I mean, I have to acknowledge it's a weak argument. Uh, you know, an argument from silence is always a weak argument. Uh, even uh, archaeologists will say, well, absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Just because you don't have something doesn't mean it wasn't there. And so we need something more solid to grab onto if we're going to conclude women should never wear trousers. Now, women did wear tunics and they did wear robes, just as the men did. And so it might be difficult to determine what the differences were between men and women's garments. Uh, we might guess that a woman did not wear trousers, but that would be a guess and not a matter of conclusive fact. And actually, you know, the Persian culture did have women wearing trousers. So looking at the verse, the verse here, I decided to look more into the Hebrew. And the actual Hebrew reads differently than this translation. One shall not, this word, wear anything pertains to a man, that pertains to that Hebrew word is the Hebrew word kali. Kali is article, vessel, implement, utensil, object, uh, all kinds of different ways it's translated. I don't see anywhere it's translated garment. 
<laughs> and uh, that the, that doesn't throw you off. Okay. Um, so it's a bit odd because I can't find a single instance where Scripture is talking about an actual garment of some kind. Maybe there is one I missed somewhere. It's really you know, commonly referring to vessels uh, going to the temple, instruments, uh, weapons. And here's a place that's Judges 18, 16, the 600 men were armed with their Kali of war, who were of the children of Dan, stood by the entrance of the gate. Now, that you could say would be a male thing. That's that's unique to men. Okay? These articles of whatever they are wearing of war. And they got the weapons there. And so the literal meaning could actually be referring to one dressing like a soldier with the armor, you know, armor on and the weapons of battle. Uh, some actually have concluded that a woman should not carry a gun because of that scripture. Or any other kind of weapon, or, you know, knife or whatever. But it seems to me that a woman, you know, putting on a soldier's attire would have been the clearest sign of cross-dressing in Israel. And since we can clearly see both men and women wore tunics and wore robes, um, you know, that does seem to be the principle is he doesn't want a woman dressing like a man or doing thing to make her doing things to make her look like a man because if you look at the situation here in reverse a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man nor shall a man put on a woman's garment now that is talking about garment there so a woman's garment a word, the word garment comes from the Hebrew word simla wrapper, a mantle, a covering garment, garments, clothes, raiment, a cloth. Now, this is not only talking about women's. There's this The simla is not only something women wore. Men wore the simlas also. So, I looked in Wikipedia. I was kind of interested about this. The simla was the heavy outer garment or shawl of various forms. It consisted of a large rectangular piece of rough heavy woolen material crudely sewed together so that the front was unstitched and with two openings left for the arms. Flax is another possible material. It is translated into Greek as hamation, and the ISBE includes, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, concludes it's closely resembled, if not identical, with the hamation of the Greeks. In the day, it was protection from rain and cold. At night, peasant Israelites could wrap themselves in this garment for warmth. The front of the Simla could also be arranged in wide folds, and all kinds of products could be carried in it. So, it doesn't look like anything gender specific. It looks like some kind of robe that was made. So, now since both men and women wore the same garments, essentially, there must have been some differences in other ways, like maybe colors. Maybe women wore certain colors like today. Uh, women wear pink and, you know, frilly things. I just, you know, textiles discovered at Masada, I found out, were cream and pink and purple. Other colors were mentioned in Roman sources include gold and walnut and yellow and all of which came from plants. And white was also worn because they had to use bleach to do that or some kind of acid uh, soda, some kind of soda to make it white. But it's also possible they, of course, they had sheep, you know, which had, you know, a light color, a, a brown and a black color. So maybe there was ornamentation or some other attachment to the garments that were, you know, to identify themselves as female. Some suggest it was their their clothing was longer than that of men. But whatever the case is, it's very unclear to me what it was. And we, I don't, I've not, I've tried, believe me, I've tried. I can't find historically what it is, and I don't think anybody knows. But it seems to me the basic message here in this verse is Yahweh doesn't want women dressing like men, and men dressing like women. And so this takes us back to the original question. Who gets to decide that? Because um, the only clear indication I can see in culture we live in, uh, <clears throat> where someone might get confused about your gender, maybe a man wearing a dress. Um, at the heart of the matter is Yahweh doesn't want gender confusion. 
And we see a lot of that going on today, uh, transvestites, cross-dressing, um, you know, all these blur, the blurring of gender lines, you know. That all leads to homosexuality, and Yahweh doesn't want that. Pants now are said to be masculine garment in some religious circles. Okay, but would a man wear a pair of pink chick jeans or capris or pantaloons? I mean, probably not. <laughs> um, so there is some differences in pant styles. And maybe I'm just being culturally influenced, but maybe that's okay, because the principle here seems to be let's avoid the gender confusion. Now, there was a time in the United States culture that women wearing pants was considered to be outrageous. A form of cross-dressing. And I don't mean just wearing pants underneath a dress, which was not too out unusual for one to wear something underneath a dress. But just wearing pants alone, without a dress. That was considered to be absolutely outrageous and improper. And masculine. Because that's what men did. <clears throat> but to some extent, Hollywood actually had a major role in changing that. And then after Hollywood kind of helped to normalize it, when, when, when men went out to war during World War II, uh, the Industrial Revolution required factories to make airplanes and bombs and tanks. And so while many men went out to war, women went to work in these factories. And I don't particularly agree with this because I think there were enough men around to do this men who were older, unable to go to war for some reason, but these women would work the kinds of jobs that were harder to do when wearing a dress. So it seems to me it all started with Hollywood. And then when they went to the factories in World War II, they started wearing pants. World War I they didn't do that. But Katherine Hepburn, very popular female actress, starting in the 1930s, She's sometimes called the mother of modern feminism. She boldly started to wear pants in her movies. And actually, Wikipedia makes a statement that Hepburn's legacy extends to fashion, where she was a pioneer for wearing trousers at a time when it was radical for a woman to do so. She contributed toward making trousers acceptable for women as fans began to imitate her clothing. Now, one woman's magazine, I'm not going to give you the name of the magazine because I don't think the magazine is particularly moral, but I found this article, and this is what it has to say about Katherine Hepburn. At the age of nine, Hepburn had her head shaved, then ran and put on her older brother's clothes. I had a phrase, phase as a child, when I wished I was a boy because I thought boys had all the fun, she told biographer Charlotte Chandler. And I know where I'm going, Catherine Hepburn, a personal biography. I did wish I could be a boy, so I decided I wanted people to call me Jimmy. I just like the name Jimmy. I told my family I wanted to be called Jimmy. This is a little girl, mind you. An actress in the making, Hepburn's cross-dressing alter ego was the part she played while her inexhaustible aggressive energy defined her screen presence, her fashion, which no doubt was an expression of her androgynous sensibility, and androgynous referring to being mixed up between male and female, raised more than a few eyebrows. In the early 1930s, women's fashion had not yet been liberated by the practicalities of World War II when women en masse took positions in business and industries while the men were at war. Women could be and were arrested if they wore pants in public and detained for masquerading as men. Catherine Hepburn was the patron saint of the independent American female. Mary McNamara wrote in her eulogy for the Los Angeles Times in 2003, Hepburn's films proved that independence and equality could be achieved within the heterosexual status quo, even while wrestling with and adopting qualities of the opposite sex. In 1933, Movie Classic Magazine ran the feature, Will It Be Trousers for Women? And Hepburn was listed along with Greta Garbo, 
Marlene Dietrich, Moselle Britton, and Faye Ray as among the stars who've lined up on the side of Trousers for Women. The opening salvo of a 1934 article from Hollywood Magazine headlined Hollywood Goes Hepburn Begins Revolution has hit the Hollywood ranks revolution of a startling war new order, and Katie Hepburn did it with her little overalls and a hatchet. Hepburn's audacious style claims writer Jerry Lane transmuted Hollywood glamorous femmes into strutting Hepburns. This is crazy. The cautionary tale of pants being the gateway drug to female perversion, Lane continues, resulted in the parade of proud, unpainted princesses with flaring nostrils and dungarees who were startlingly frank, obviously brainy, filled with the new take-it-or-leave-it spirit. And she said, I have not lived as a woman. I have lived as a man. Hepburn told Barbara Walters in 1981, I've done what I, expletive, well, wanted to do, wanted to, and I made enough money to support myself, and I ain't afraid of being alone. That's where it all started. Now, to me, that's disturbing. Here is a photo of Catherine Hepburn. Um... Looks pretty masculine to me. I mean, women with Hepburn's attitude and personality often do it for reasons of security. They don't want to be vulnerable and have to rely upon men or lean on men for their security. And so out of fear of being vulnerable, they adopt more masculine traits. And you might say it worked. They're not as vulnerable as they used to be. Women can go and take the same job most any man can in our culture. Women have been liberated, they say. But at what cost? Women are no longer home with their babies. Babies and children are sent to daycare centers. Children are sent to government schools to learn the ways of the world and get involved in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yahweh uniquely equipped women for nurturing for nursing, for having the sensitivity to care for a child's needs. But that's been rejected. We see uh, one of the most common distinctions between men and women here in this restroom <laughs> sign. You see the women have the dress and the men don't. I mean, it's just a common sign for femininity. I do have a full study on gender roles recently done this past summer. Um, biblical masculinity and biblical femininity. Um, July 23rd, 2016 and July 30th on the Roman calendar. Eliad.com forward slash transcripts. And, uh, and you can watch those studies. And I do believe it's very important that we do grasp this. So, women wearing pants were obviously considered to be a sign of rebellion. Early 1900s, a sign of a feminist agenda with women leaving, women leaving their children and joining the workforce, with women like Catherine Hepburn, her masculine attitude, being communicated with her on-screen persona to do what she expletive well pleases to do. Ain't going to rely on no man. And, listen, I blame the men. For not taking good care of their ladies. I blame the men. We were a stumbling block to the women in those ages, those times. To some extent we still are. But uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, today some of the controversy over women wearing pants seems to be a, kind of a distant or forgotten memory in our culture. And But one thing is clear. At one time in America wearing pants was considered to be distinctly masculine and women wearing pants was controversial because it was a form of cross-dressing. That's a fact. It was considered to be cross-dressing. And so today, what's the sign that helps us determine men and women is the dress. Uh, and so there's some things about this that do bother me. Now, one could argue it's no longer the case. 
women wear pants every day and it's not really seen as cross-dressing and I'm not talking about pants underneath a dress I mean wearing pants alone and not a dress again I'm not talking about wearing pants underneath a dress I'm talking about wearing pants alone and not a dress let me ask you how does your clothing make you feel do you feel feminine when you put on a pair of pants do you feel distinctly feminine I received a very interesting email from a very Yahweh fearing woman I respect highly she wanted to share a testimony as to why she started wearing a dress she used to wear pants and this is from woman to woman this is something that she wanted to share so I want to share a testimony as to why we the females in the family started wearing dresses and skirts I was very much a tomboy growing up I hated wearing dresses and did everything boys did I actually wondered why oh he made me a girl because I had nothing in common with them I like to play with cars horses fish still like that work with dad's tools like getting grimy and working on my bike Wore clothes from the boys' department at Sears. I would never play with dolls. Hated being in the house. Like being very independent and strong. Make note, I had zero homosexual tendencies. Fast forward, I've been married to Chad about 10 years, and we were managing a cattle ranch in East Texas. For years, I had been telling all the Pentecostal folks around me, telling me, I should wear dresses that they could not tell me that from the Bible because both men and women wore dresses. I guess they both had robes and long tunics. One day I was coming home one day by myself. I had to stop to get one of the many cattle gates before I got to the house. I got to the gate and the father told me loud and clear, you need to repent. These words just came strong in my mind. I was taken by surprise and asked, Repent for what, Father? He clearly told me, You need to repent for wanting to be a boy. And this really blew me out of the water. I had never thought of that before. I broke down at the gate, sobbing and repenting. I felt cleansed, and at that very moment, felt a strong desire to go find a skirt to put on. I wanted to look and be feminine for the first time in my entire life. Chad was super, super surprised, but loved the idea. I felt from then on, by no man's influence, I should look and dress distinctly female. It was a huge change in our lives. Chad, Chad loved the results of me being less independent. I felt the father was wanting me to wear dresses full time, and I wanted to. I have been wearing them now for 15 years. I wear them riding horses, working cattle, and everything. All the years I defended women wearing pants, I now encourage them to take hold of their femininity and dress the way Yahweh created them to be, distinctly female. As we live in such a confused gender society, even cross-dressers wear dresses and not pants. They know dresses are for women, regardless of how modest they may look, pants just look masculine. That's funny coming from me. When wearing pants, it also makes a woman act different and walk different. Most women are unaware of it, so there's my story. It was not a modesty issue in the beginning, and we just want to dress distinctly feminine. I think it's interesting to read the history of women and pants. Here is one, you may be surprised how far it went back. Reading it, you see the connections of women taking on a men's role and what wearing pants represents. I cannot express enough how wearing skirts full-time has changed my life for the better. I have been so blessed by it. There has not been one day that I have desired to wear pants alone. We wear them under our skirts. We even swim in skirts below the knee. Something really happens spiritually within when wearing them. I pray they will never be taken from me. I am trying to pinpoint exactly what it is, and I can't. Maybe more joy, contentment, satisfaction, peace, a wonderful feeling of being confidently feminine these, these things but so much more I cannot explain and so how I pray Yah's women can experience this for themselves and give him glory if they wear them grudgingly it will not work because it's not from the heart nor desire they have to lay it down fully at his feet and maybe as in my case be broken and repentful for not fully embracing the femininity he gave them we are just not aware of the blessings he has for us when we walk in all his ways. A lot of women are not really not wanting to hear this message. It has been embedded in our culture as long as we are old. 
I was not wanting to hear it for a long time. Praise Yahweh for pursuing me and not giving up on me and for blessing me in such a big, life-changing way. I thought that was a very good testimony. I appreciated that, um, you know. So take, you know, I'm not going to preach it directly and say it's what you better wear. I, I do want to say that um, it's certainly more distinctly feminine in an age where we need to communicate the differences between men and women. And so I do encourage men to put your beard, let your beard grow some and and women to put your put your dresses back on because look where it all came from and what are we communicating maybe even to the older generation who remembers these things. Um, so and some people feel well I don't feel like I'm going to be able to attract a young man, you know, if I start putting on old-fashioned dresses or something. You know, what what's going to happen with that? And so I, I put this little poll out there. I'm going to see what my latest results are. I'm very curious. I have not seen the results yet. As to what men actually find to be more attractive. I put this out there as part of our uh, poll for today's broadcast. When when you went to Elliot.com slash live, um, I put a poll up there and I asked the following question. Do you believe do you believe a woman is more feminine, lovely, and attractive, not in a carnal way, when she wears a dress? And I asked only the men to answer this question. I didn't want women to answer it. I only wanted men to answer the question. There were 78 responses to this question just from this morning. I had put it up there. And the 78 votes that we got, 96% said yes. She is more feminine, lovely, and attractive, not in a carnal way, when she wears a dress. 96 percent. That's 96 out of 100 on average. Believe a woman is more lovely, more feminine, and more attractive. Not in a carnal way. When she wears a dress, only three out of 78 people thought otherwise. And these are men of Yahweh. These are not worldly people. These are men of Yahweh. And so, if you want to um, be attractive to a man of Elohim, a man who loves Yahweh, and therefore he's accountable to a greater power than himself, and he'll have to obey that scripture that says, love your wives as Messiah loved the assembly. If you want a man who will love you like Yahshua loves you, um, that's who you want to attract. Then be lovely, be feminine, and put on a dress. That's my advice. I wasn't anticipating that. That's, a, that's an awesome... I mean, I agree. I mean, I see. I personally believe that myself. Uh, and so, there we go. Hallelujah. Now, to some extent, um, we know that uh, wearing pants became more accepted in our culture because of the attention that women were getting from men. Men are more attracted by sight than women are. And when I say attention, I mean because what was previously a very private part of the body, a woman's rear end, which is distinctively shaped compared to the man, was now exposed, whereas before it was not. Lustful men would then give women who exposed that part of their body a lot of attention. Whistles and cat calls and attention sometimes even led to embarrassment were the norm as women's jeans got tighter and tighter. That's the wrong spirit. We have now a combination of cross-dressing and lust in our culture that led to women wearing pants becoming popular. That's the spirit of the world. We've not received the spirit of the world. We receive the spirit that comes from Elohim. 
We don't want an effeminate spirit, and we don't want a spirit that confuses gender. It's so important in our culture today that we be a light in this area. Now, I know it's a major thing for some of you as I share these things. I'm not trying to pressure you or, or make you feel bad if you don't agree with me. Um, I'm submitting all the best points I know of to support the idea of women pulling the dresses back on. But uh, I'm not going to look down on you if you see a different view. Um, men, be patient with your wives, with your daughters. We live in a culture that is so, so hostile to the things of Elohim. Um, and I'll tell you that I'll tell you one thing though that my daughters, when they're in town, they have these dresses on. They get more respect and more people complimenting their their clothing. It's amazing. Um, and they're young. They're young girls, 11, 12, 13. And they get complimented. And my wife has reported she noticed a difference. She started putting on a dress that men treat her like a lady. They are more like a gentleman toward her. They treat her with a higher level of respect. More men were opening the door for her and holding the door open for her. Different things were happening. Um, and so our dress does communicate. The things that we wear do communicate certain things. And we want to be the kind of people that uh, lead people back to the way things should be. Let's pray. Oh, Father Yahweh, I just pray in Yahshua's name. You would lead us to a place where you want us to be in the clothing choices that we make. We thank you for your love. We thank you that we're not defined by what people say of us, but you've already decided that we are a people of great worth, a special treasure for your glory. We thank you that men, we are princes, and women are princesses. We thank you that Yahshua has called us and loved us in a way that is so very evident. Help us to live our lives to glorify you. Teach us and instruct us in the ways of holiness and purity and love and truth. And Father, forgive us if we have allowed the spirit of the world to impact how we dress or attitudes. Forgive us, Father Yahweh, if we've not put our trust in you and look to you and to glorify you with both our bodies and our spirit which belong to you. We want to see your kingdom and your name be glorified on this earth as it is in heaven. Establish your kingdom in our hearts right now. Deliver us from the enemy who seeks to redefine who we are, who tempts us to walk in the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, which are not of you, but are of the world. For truly yours is the kingdom and power and glory and majesty. And truly all praise, honor, and worship belongs to you. Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh our mighty one, forever and ever. In Yahshua's great name we pray. Amen.